Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. In Michigan, three more people have been convicted in the plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Who are they and what role did they play? Two counties in western battleground states are on a mission to ensure election integrity by hand counting thousands of early ballots. Plus, hear the latest on recent debates in Pennsylvania and New York. As midterms loom, President Biden rolling out new steps he says will lower costs for Americans. A move some critics are calling a band-aid on a bullet wound. Former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is ordered to testify in Georgia. It's part of an investigation into GOP communication after the 2020 election. The man who plowed through a Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin last year is found guilty on six counts of first-degree intentional murder and 70 other charges. And in New York City is now in an illegal battle over its vaccine mandate for public workers. That's after a state Supreme Court struck the mandate down. We spoke with a legal expert about where this might end and the importance of separation of powers. Three men have been found guilty of materially aiding gang members in a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. They were among more than a dozen men charged in 2020 for what authorities described as a broad conspiracy. The group was upset about Whitmer imposing harsh restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. A high-profile conspiracy case in Michigan is back in the spotlight. Three men accused of participating in a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer were convicted by a Jackson County jury. Paul Beller, Joseph Morrison, and Pete Musico heard their guilty verdicts on Wednesday. The three men provided aid to Adam Fox and Barry Croft, who were convicted by a federal jury two months ago. But they have appealed their convictions. Prosecutors argued the three men helped to train Fox and Croft, who have been called the ringleaders in the plot. Governor Whitmer, who was campaigning for re-election, responded in a tweet, These verdicts are further proof that violence and threats have no place in our politics. State and federal charges were brought last year against several people accused of conspiracy, gang membership, and weapon charges. In January 2021, at the height of the state-mandated COVID-19 lockdowns, Ty Garbin pleaded guilty. He then helped prosecutors in their investigation of the other defendants. Another defendant, Caleb Franks, later pleaded guilty. Whitmer, in a 2020 speech, blamed former President Donald Trump for influencing the men to act. According to the Associated Press, she said Trump's debate speeches stoked distrust in those who spread fear and hatred. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. This trial in state court was an offshoot of the main case in federal court, which produced mixed results, conspiracy convictions for Fox and three others, but also two acquittals. And two, two counties in Arizona and Nevada are expected to hand count early voter ballots today. NTD's Arlene Richards has that story, plus updates on key Pennsylvania and New York races. Under a cloud of distrust for voter machines, two counties in western battleground states aren't taking any chances. On Wednesday, Nye County in Nevada and Cochise County in Arizona were scheduled to start hand counting early in-person votes and mail-in ballots. In Arizona, two Republicans on the three-member Board of Supervisors voted to authorize a hand count audit in all precincts. Secretary of State Katie Hobbs threatened to take legal action. She posted on Twitter, if they don't provide assurances they'll proceed in compliance with the law by 5 p.m., we'll see them in court. In Nevada, a state Supreme Court approved the hand count last week, but the Secretary of State's office has to approve the county's written proposal on how the count will be conducted. The Republicans' nominee for Secretary of State, Jim Marchant, believes hand counting should be done in every county. On the other hand, critics don't think counting thousands of ballots by hand will produce accurate results. In both Arizona and Nevada, November's elections will determine the outcome of high-stakes gubernatorial and Senate contests. Speaking of high-stakes races, key debates were held in Pennsylvania and New York on Tuesday. In Pennsylvania, Senate candidates Mehmet Oz and John Fetterman clashed in their first and only debate. 
On the topic of abortion, Oz said he supports exceptions for bans, but that ultimately each state should decide. There should not be involvement from the federal government in how states decide their abortion decisions. Fetterman, who was recovering from a recent stroke, stumbled over his words and repeated himself when answering. But he was firm about his stance on abortion. I have always believed that the choice belongs women and their doctors. The candidates also had opposing views on illegal immigration, with Oz saying there's a humanitarian crisis at the border and Fetterman calling for a bipartisan solution. Fetterman and Oz are vying to replace retiring Republican Senator Pat Toomey. Over in New York, Governor Kathy Hochul faced her Republican challenger, Congressman Lee Zeldin. On the issue of crime, Zeldin pushed for safe streets. We can continue with the status quo where they believe they haven't passed enough pro-criminal laws, or we could take control of our destiny and make sure law-abiding New Yorkers are in charge of our streets again. Hochul pushed for gun control rather than locking people up. But there is no crime-fighting plan if it doesn't include guns, illegal guns, and you refuse to talk about how we can do so much more. Hochul's lead over Zeldin is narrowing. A recent Quinnipiac University poll showed she now leads by just four percentage points, down from 20 earlier in the race. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. The battleground state of Arizona has a mixed group of voters, but their take on modern day politics appears to be quite similar. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup, who caught up with some of the voters in the Grand Canyon State. Talking to voters in Arizona's state capital is a wild card. Even in the urban area of Phoenix, we met a variety of voters from each party. Yeah, the economy is an issue, you know, inflation. Egg shouldn't be 350. Cash shouldn't be where it's at. Do you think that the Biden administration has done enough to tame inflation? You have trust that after a while it will be able to calm down. Listen, we all know, I think they're doing the best they can. We all know not one administration ever carries all the weight for any, any of the challenges we have. While there are various opinions around these policies, one area that many voters do have in common is that they say the polarization in politics has gone too far. I think things are getting really polarized, so um, really kind of concerned about that. I, I don't think there's enough of the two candidates talking about the issues. I, I don't think Kelly's running on anything more than just he's not Blake Masters. If you're, if you're going to just make the whole campaign be, well, I'm not the other guy, I think that's just immature voting and immature campaigning. Democrats overall didn't seem too enthused about Biden's record, and Republicans didn't seem to care too much about Trump's endorsements. On both sides of the coin, enthusiasm is lacking. There's so much corruption, I don't think that my vote would matter. You know, the issues we've had, both sides of the, the political spectrum, uh, people are just exhausted and tired, and, and really the, the interest is almost not there anymore. I think both parties are in a relative decline. They've lost really the trust of the American people in general. Many voters called on candidates to focus more on policy issues, while others say the media should do better at reporting accurately. How do you go about this? There's so much distrust currently that uh, it's not an easy fix. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. There's just been so much stuff that comes out that's false and so much stuff just thrown out there and hoping something sticks that it's, it's, we need to go back to maybe a little bit more traditional reporting. So far, just around 400,000 voters have cast ballots in early voting, which is just a fraction of the 4 million who've registered. Reporting in Phoenix, Arizona, Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And Biden is telling Americans that prices on everything will fall over time. But his approval rating just fell again right before the midterms. NTD's Iris Tao has more from the White House. With less than two weeks left before the midterms, President Biden again tells Americans that he's working on fighting high costs. I'm optimistic it's going to take some time. And uh, I appreciate the frustration of the American people. Today's focus was on eliminating so-called junk fees from banks and credit card companies, such as late fees and surprised overdraft fees. While they may seem small, Biden says they add up. And these steps will immediately start saving Americans collectively billions of dollars in unfair fees, giving them, as my dad would say again, just a little breathing room. 
And Biden's been using that breathing room phrase pretty often recently, trying to send a message that his party understands what everyday Americans are facing. But not everyone is buying it. Republican Congressman Pat Fallon on Wednesday called Biden's vow to lower costs a bull-faced lie, saying he's just, quote, putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. Yet Biden defends his economic record by citing a recent drop in gas prices. The most common price right now in America is $3.39 a gallon. It's going to come down more. But there's some bad news for Biden. A Gallup poll released Wednesday shows his approval ratings just dropped to 40 percent, retreating from a modest recovery in August. And that's no good news for Democrats either, as they're fighting to hold majorities in the upcoming midterms. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. And former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has to testify in a case about events after the 2020 election in Georgia. A South Carolina judge ruled that he must testify in person. A Fulton County District Attorney is leading the special grand jury probe in Georgia. This is surrounding former President Trump's call with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger following the 2020 presidential election. The DA points to Meadows' involvement in the call and subpoenaed Meadows to testify. Meadows now lives in South Carolina. The South Carolina judge ruled today that Meadows is necessary to the investigation. Meadows' attorney told CNN that he plans to appeal the ruling. And yesterday we reported that Google's been accused of manipulating search results to favor the Democratic Party while making Republican websites harder to find. The big tech company is currently in the middle of a censorship lawsuit, and if Google loses, it may not be able to censor any longer. NTD's Jason Perry hears from one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. A recent report by the Media Research Center claims Google is manipulating search results against Republicans just before the midterms. Google denies the allegations and says it would never manipulate search results to disadvantage any political ideology. This comes as Google battles in an ongoing court case over alleged interference in the 2020 elections. Thousands of conservative media YouTube videos were blocked shortly before the 2020 presidential election. YouTube, which is owned by Google, said the purpose was to make sure they gave people authoritative information while limiting the reach of what it called misinformation and harmful content. Attorney Chris Armenta is representing 15 people whose channels were blocked by YouTube. She presented an analogy to the judges about a book her ninth grader was reading called Fahrenheit 451 which is the case in which Ray Bradbury wrote of a dystopian society in which firemen, instead of putting out fires, they burned books and sometimes the people along with them in the interest of creating conformity and squelching independent thought. In this case, YouTube is the book burner. They are alleging that Google cooperated with the federal government in deciding which channels to censor. Google denies doing so. Attorneys representing Google said YouTube applied its own content policies in making the decision to remove those channels. I spoke with Sarah Westall, one of the plaintiffs in the case, who had her YouTube channel blocked shortly before the 2020 election. Zuckerberg came out and said that happened. And why were they shutting down the laptop stories? Well, they were trying to keep the, make sure their guys win. And we didn't just do, you know, the Hunter laptop. I mean, we were talking about the, um, the COVID, we had a lot of doctors on. It wasn't matching their narrative, but what we said ended up being true. The oral arguments in the case wrapped up last week, and the judges are expected to make a decision in the coming months. The case could go to the Supreme Court. Westall says people who want to learn more about the lawsuit can visit her website at sarahwestall.com. Jason Perry, NTD News. The Los Angeles police are officially investigating the city council recording that led to two officials resigning. The audio may have been recorded illegally. Police Chief Michael Moore said Tuesday that Los Angeles detectives are investigating whether a recording last year, which captured city council members speaking disparagingly of others, was made illegally. Has initiated a criminal investigation into uh, an allegation of eavesdropping uh, relative to the uh, LA Fed meeting involving uh, then council person uh, Nuri Martinez, uh, council member Gil Cedillos, and council member. Uh, Kevin DeLeon and the Fed president, 
Mr. Herrera. The uproar began with a previously unknown recording of an October 2021 private meeting involving the four officials. It was leaked earlier this month, just weeks before Election Day. The recording of the closed-door meeting revealed that offensive language was used to mock colleagues while they planned to protect Latino political strength in council districts. It's not known who made the tape or why. Under California law, all parties must consent to the recording of a private conversation or phone call. Otherwise, the person who made the recording could face criminal and civil penalties. Martinez de Leon Cedillo and Herrera approached the Los Angeles Police Department on Friday and asked for the agency to open an investigation. Martinez resigned, while Cedillo and de Leon resisted widespread calls for them to step down. No suspects have been identified yet. The man who plowed through a Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin last year was today convicted on six counts of first-degree intentional murder. The Waukesha County jury also convicted the man, Daryl Brooks, on 61 counts of reckless endangerment and other charges totaling 76. The dead ranged in age from 8 to 81, and more than 60 others were injured in the attack, including at least 18 children. At the time of the attack, Brooks was out on bail on a domestic abuse charge. During his closing argument, he said he had no intention of hurting anyone. The penalty for each murder charge is life in prison. And a court has found New York City's vaccine mandate for city workers unconstitutional. However, the city says it'll keep the mandate in place. We spoke with a New York legal expert to find out what happens next. A New York State Supreme Court judge on Monday ruled New York City's vaccine mandate for public workers is unconstitutional. He says the city's health commissioner, who is part of the executive branch, doesn't have the power to impose such a law due to the separation of powers. The judge also said the city has to rehire the 16 sanitation workers who filed the lawsuit and that they're entitled to back pay. New York City plans to keep the mandate in place, telling the Epoch Times that the city strongly disagrees with this ruling, as the mandate is firmly grounded in law and is critical to New Yorkers' public health. Bobby Ann Cox, an attorney in New York, says the case now lies in another court's hands. You know, now it goes to a different court. So now it's going to go to the appellate division, um, which covers New York City area. And so that's a panel of judges. Um, Those judges are appointed. They're not elected by the people. The judge who struck down the vaccine mandate is a Republican. The judges who will preside over the appeal are appointed by the governor, which in New York have been Democrats for the past 20 years. Attorney Cox successfully fought New York State's so-called quarantine camps this year, which were implemented by the governor. The judges in her quarantine camp case and the judge in this week's vaccine mandate case both touched upon the issue of separation of power. This is actually a trend that we're seeing not just in New York, but in other states as well, and and certainly at the federal level as well, where we see the executive branch overstepping, they're overreaching, and they're taking powers that are reserved for the legislative branch of government. She says an example for that on the federal level was when the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a regulation from Biden's Environmental Protection Agency. The agency is part of the executive branch and tried to regulate air emissions. The Supreme Court ruled that only Congress can impose such laws. Really, it's a very important issue. Separation of powers is what our country is founded upon. We have to maintain those three different sections of our government, the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. She added, it's critical to our democracy to have the three branches. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, at least 15 people killed in a shooting in Iran. Several gunmen attacked the country's second holiest site. And in international sports news, the World Cup fan reported missing while trekking to Qatar may be alive and well after all. NTD's Dave Martin has the story. That and more coming up. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. 
never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Vacation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of 6 to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Vacation, aka renbiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career. Now turning our attention to Iran. Several gunmen opened fire at a mosque today, killing at least 15 people. Just a warning, the following footage may be disturbing to some viewers. According to Iranian media, at least three gunmen attacked the country's second holiest site, a Shiite mosque, on Wednesday. They killed at least 15 people and wounded dozens more. This is what one of the witnesses said on Iranian TV. <laughs> I went to the mosque with my children and I heard sounds of gunfire after we prayed. We went to a room next to the shrine and this thug came and fired a barrage of shots. Bullets hit my arm and leg and hit my wife's back. But thank God my child was not hit. He is seven years old. State TV blamed the attack on Sunni Muslim extremists who have targeted the country's Shiite majority in the past. Two of the gunmen have reportedly been arrested and a third one is on the run. The attack took place in the city of Shiraz, in south-central Iran. It came as people elsewhere in Iran marked 40 days since the death of Masa Amini, which sparked large-scale anti-government protests. The attack appeared to be unrelated to the protests. But Iran's interior minister blamed the protests for paving the way for such, quote, terrorist attacks. The Iranian president vowed that the shooting would not go unanswered. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And Britain's new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has restored a ban on fracking after it was lifted briefly by his predecessor, Liz Truss. The ban comes amid growing concerns over energy security in the region, as well as questions over the safety of the fracking technique in England after it triggered a 2.9 magnitude earthquake in 2019. Sunak's move returns the country's Conservative Party back to its 2019 manifesto that had banned the method, which involves drilling into the earth to get gas from shale rock. The new prime minister said in Parliament today his administration would deliver more offshore wind and more nuclear power. And now, over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Santiago Sanchez, who is walking from Madrid to Qatar for the World Cup, has apparently been arrested in Iran. This is according to the Spanish Foreign Ministry. In addition, a Kurdish group called the Henga Organization for Human Rights said he was taken away by Iranian security forces after visiting the grave of Masa Amini. That's the young Iranian woman who died in police custody after not following the strict dress code. Sanchez, who's an experienced trekker, former paratrooper and big World Cup fan, had been documenting his journey on his popular Instagram account when he suddenly stopped communicating on October 2nd, the day after crossing the Iran-Iraq border. By the 17th, his parents reported him missing. The 41-year-old adventurer has been on the road for 11 months with his wheeled cart, which carries a tent, a gas stove, a water purifier system, and a small suitcase. He said he wanted to learn how others live before reaching Qatar. Elsewhere in sports, LA Rams All-Pro Aaron Donald and Boston Celtics All-Star Jalen Brown have both dropped Donda Sports, the brand management agency owned by Kanye West, also known as Ye. Both players said the decision was based on Ye's tweet earlier this month when he said he was going, quote, death con three on Jewish people. Both Twitter and Meta have locked Ye's social media accounts over his remarks. In response, Ye announced he had signed a deal to purchase the social media platform Parler. And in sports this evening, three NHL games are on the schedule tonight, including a battle of New York with the Rangers and Islanders set to square off. 
Meanwhile, in the NBA tonight, 20 teams are in action with the star-studded Lakers who will be looking for their first win of the season, taking on the Nuggets. And that's it for sports. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And lastly, it's one thing to cook fish for a meal, but it's another when a top-tier chef does it. NTD's David Lamb went to watch a three-star Michelin chef showcase several dishes made from a Taiwanese fish. Members of the media gathered on Tuesday at Alexander's Steakhouse in Cupertino, California to hear from and get a taste of cooking done by French chef Claude Letoic. The main ingredient during the demonstration was the Taiwanese grouper. I was very excited to get the grouper and did some, uh, some recipe for, for you today. Um, I did three recipes. Uh, the first one is a more French recipe. Letoic's first interpretation was the pan-seared grouper in artichoke baragul sauce. The grouper is one of Taiwan's popular exports. The Council of Agriculture, Executive Yuan of Taiwan, partnered with a three-star Michelin chef. He's currently head chef at the French diner called 165 in San Francisco. It's good, you know, when you get new ingredients, of course, because you, uh, you, uh, you get the chance to experiment uh, a new, new, thing, new things, you know. That's the first time I see a thick... Uh, uh, a skin like that on a fish. He's been to Taiwan several times and said it was inspiring to see the different types of cuisine. While many cultures cook fish in cuts without bones, many Asian countries cook fish as a whole. His second dish is the grouper with black pepper sauce and baby spinach, which he enjoyed, calling it sophisticated. The event organizer, Katie Shea, who's also a food blogger, appreciates the culinary mixture. Several layers of the flavor, flavor and I compare with uh, the other sauce, I think it's very different. I like the Thai curry and uh, with the Taiwanese grouper. The, the flavor is uh, complicated, but uh, it's very well. <laughs> yeah. Letoic tells NTD about the art behind his cooking. It's a passion, you know, if you uh, don't like what you do, it's, uh, it's, it's become very difficult. The cuisine, the result, it's all about the detail. If you pay attention to all detail, you're probably going to be a good cook. But if you go, don't pay attention to the detail, you will uh, miss, miss a lot of things that are important in the kitchen. He shared a tip when cooking fish. Just marinated your fish on the water salt and then uh, honey like uh, you know uh, just to one a couple of hours so your fish will be more moist and then you you will never overcook your fish now the french chef said he went through about 20 fishes before getting to the final three and this is one of them a whole taiwanese grouper and it's seasoned with asian curry sauce david lamb entity news california looks delicious well, that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.